musicians in bars getting beer is Dylan now and where and what are you getting? <laughs> uh, nothing currently in the moment. There's no way to go to a bar, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in your living room? I, I'm in the uh, sun room at the moment, so it's kind of, I guess you could say it's my living room. <laughs> and uh, what's up for you? Uh, me, so, well, since being in quarantine, I've just been uh, writing nonstop and, and practicing. I have um, Ilmer's second record is just, um, it's just wrapping up. Uh, there is a third one that's on the way, and I've just been kind of uh, finishing up the writing process for that. Um, been also working with uh, Birds of Bellwoods on some uh, on some demo tracks, and uh, yeah, no, it's been um, it's been good. It's been it's been great, kind of um, just having all the time be focused on the creative uh, process. Um, that's, that's one of the benefits, isn't it? The stress uh, the stress of running around town is uh, lower, and so you get to work more on your stuff. Yeah, but since we can't play shows, we can't um, uh, we can't tour at all because of the of the, of the pandemic, um, which is which is of course under, um, completely understandable. But we've decided that we'll use that time to be creative and try and, you know, write as many songs as possible. So you mentioned Ayomar's second album, and I remember talking to you on the roof of Murphy's Lawn. That's right, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was so sunny of it that, you know, we didn't get very much video, usable video. So, uh, so that was right at the beginning. So tell me how that's evolved over the last little while. It's an ongoing process with, uh, with that band. It's... Originally, it just started out as kind of a, as like, uh, you know, a solo project, and then it's kind of just evolved over time into a, uh, um, into a bit, like, pretty much a full functioning band. The first year we started to play shows, we were kind of trying different combinations of things, like, um, since a bunch of the members play in other different projects, we, um, we kind of had to compensate for their schedule, as well as Eilmer's schedule. So it's like... So if one member couldn't make it, we would either have to, um, we would either have to have um, somebody fill in, or we had have to uh, say like, hey, since Gabe can't make the show and he's he does half the vocals, can Mike jump on vocals for for this part? Okay. So it's kind of like the different kind of combinations of stuff like that. I think the only, uh, I think it's just Sam and myself who's played all. Um, I think we've only played about seven shows at the moment, uh, pretty much in the GTA. And I think with the way things are going for the second release, it feels like now that this is a very kind of cohesive lineup. And and uh, no, I'm just really happy with with how it's all um, with how it's all uh, how it's all going. Well, that's great. Do you want to talk about the other people in the band that are that are working with you now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, a lot of the a lot of these guys were the same. Same lineup I've been working with uh, for the past uh, couple years, and uh, well, Sam Astroth, who plays in um, you know Astroth Incarnate, he's fairly, very very good vocalist, uh, really really nice guy, um, just just an absolute like pleasure to be around. I mean the guy's just he, he's just a really really talented vocalist. Um, then we have Gabe as well, who is um, also doing kind of cleans and um, and he's doing a little, little bit of. Um, a little bit of bass and now he's kind of switched over to um uh acoustic instruments as well so for live he'll be handling that as well and he's just great and i've known him for for ages uh playing playing with hallows die well he and i play in another band together called hallows die <laughs> right so when you so say that, cleans you mean to the layman that's clean vocals yes clean vocals yeah 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 correct yeah 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 um cool. yeah and we also have um, we have Alex Zubair, who's an amazing guitar player. He was on Shredders of Metal too, um, so <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's great, um, absolutely great guy. And we have uh, Mike, who um, who we known for for a while. Um, he he helped out with um, one of the one of the last tours that Vesperia was on. We um, uh, he was a big help in that regard, and he was just, you know, just overall just great guy. So we have him on board, and that's kind of the guitar tandem. And if one of those two guys couldn't make it, then we have Pat Rogers as well from the Hallows Die, who helps in um, as as much as um, as much as he can if there's like a schedule conflict. So, uh. and then of course on the record is um, is uh, 
you know, Tyler Williams, just really, really amazing production and engineer. And, uh, and he played a lot of bass on the record. And then there's a couple of guests um, that, uh, that I'll be announcing soon. I think that's the first mention for Vesperia there. Do you want to... Oh, with um, with regards to Vesperia, we are uh, there's a lot of things in the works now, and uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say too too much about it. But um, we have something special planned for possibly the end of this year or early next year. Great. Yeah, it's I, I'm happy that they um, could say we've been we're 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 writing a new record. We're recording your record. You're allowed to say that much. I'm probably allowed to say that much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just I trying to keep it. Just trying to keep it. The, trying to keep uh, everything in suspense a bit. <laughs> yeah. There's a, an air of professionalism that I've uh, detected from dealings with you, and um, like right, right from the first time we met. But um, the other thing is, there's a very laid back nature to you and your whole family. There's influences and things that are part of your upbringing and then there's things that you've done to diverge from that well i mean like to, to mention like uh just what you were saying for for just being laid back i just feel like that's just how um how it should be in any sort of band environment is you always want to be super relaxed and calm and just you know and just not stress too much about it because you're playing um you're playing music and that just brings so much joy in your life and you don't want to have the the added stress of being like like oh my god it's got to be so perfect in this like yes. it's got to be so perfect in this section and has to be like it has to be exactly like this you can't like in any sort of band environment you can't have this kind of um like be kind of like authoritative in a way <laughs> You know, I, I know that a lot of young bands are electronically minded already. They've got web pages and things like that. But the, li the delivery systems and and the, it's, it may be the only way to reach your fans for quite some time and that sort of thing. Um, so where do you think this is going to take the music business? Good question. Um, well, the, the idea at the moment was kind of like, um, I don't know if you saw the, the Live Nation um, article that came out a couple of days ago, how they're saying they wanted musicians to take a pay cut with, with a lot of the shows that are going forward when everything comes back, so to speak, which is kind of, which is, you know, to, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but I, I think the, the way that the music industry is changing right now is more bands are starting to realize that, you know, doing live stream shows or anything like that, there's going to be a lot more of that as we're currently currently uh, seeing how everybody is doing things live from their living room or their rehearsal space now. And I, and I think there's, there's an appeal to that as well, because if let's say if you live in like a, like a metropolitan area or like, like what I mean by that is you live in like a city of over a million people. You don't want to commute. You don't want to pay for parking. You don't want to, you know, pay for over overpriced beer, that kind of thing. Um, so they can watch a whole entire show and hear new songs from the comfort of their living room. That's a very appealing thing. Um, the YouTube date is a thing nowadays. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, there's definitely going to be a lot more of that. And, and so tell us what it's like keeping your chops in different genres. Well, it, it just really comes down to um, just just practicing uh, nonstop. I mean, when you when you are in the rehearsal space, it's always good to kind of have a, a practice schedule. So it's like, okay, I'll take half hour working on um, working on the Vesperia set. I'll take maybe forty five minutes to work on the Bird set, and same with Vesperia or with any with or with any sort of project that that I'm that I'm involved in. And that changes when you do session work. When the moment you get the call to do um, a record, then that schedule pretty much goes, okay, so 90% is gonna be on this, we're focusing on this release. And then once that's done, I go back to my own, my own stuff. Oh, uh, so it's all just, uh, you could pretty much do it on a spreadsheet. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to, kind, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's good to kind of keep it consistent schedule when you when you practice so you have like a certain time that's 
that's designated to um, to like hand hand warm ups or feet warm ups or um, coordination exercises. You have a set block for that. Then you have things you want to work on in terms of uh, like you saw like a really cool song that you want to kind of you want to learn because it helps out with coordination or anything like that. So you you set a time for that, and then you go for um, okay like writing for Iomer or uh, or with any other project, or if you get assigned uh, songs, like if Birds of Bellwood sends me a song that they want me to learn, then I will go and designate my time to learning that song and have it uh, be like second nature. So so that's kind of how, um, how it all kind of uh, breaks down. Sounds very disciplined, and it also sounds like a musical smorgasbord. You kind of have yeah. <laughs> a better choice of what, where to create, where to be. Yeah. Where to let yourself loose. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think it's just always good to kind of have that, that level of discipline. I think that happens from me practicing, uh, martial arts, uh, years and years ago. So yeah. tell us about your, you know, musical immersion since birth, pretty much, or whatever it's been. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, it it kind of started off with just, um, well, when you're, when you grow up in a very uh, musical family, and you grow up as well with everybody having some f f um, form of being um, creative, like they, like everybody kind of has a creative outlet, and whether that be music or painting or uh, or writing, that that always was encouraged to have that kind of to have that outlet. And but when you see uh, a lot of people in in your family that do. Um, music and then you see them on stage and how much joy it brings to their life then you want to pursue that same career as well because it's like hey that looks like fun and I want to try that and and that's how it kind of started like you know seeing seeing dad on stage was was huge because you know he was you could just see him on stage and how much fun that he was having and it's like well I want to try that and do you remember the moment like was there a particular stage show was it on tv or or live that uh, that did it i think it was just seeing dad play constantly and i think finally just having the just finally having the courage to to pick up an instrument but i didn't know which one to pick first so um it was actually my sister and my grandpa funny enough that that, that said um that said like well there's no drummers in the family so why don't you try that and that's kind of how the uh, uh, how that um, path started was just me going and learning how to play drums and um, and you know just going to uh, just taking lessons as well as just watching YouTube videos and um, and then kind of finding new things uh, on my own as well just by practicing nonstop. So that's kind of how it happened. And then you play and. You play in several bands once you get the confidence to um, to jam with other people and uh, yeah, you just kind of it's just came this kind of gradual evolution and then and then that's in around seventeen I joined Hallows Die and we to that same summer we toured all across Eastern Canada we went all the way to Nova Scotia and pretty much back we so we were gone for like roughly three weeks and. So and that, professional gig up by the time you're 17. Yeah. Right. And, um, well, it's like the, the, the first gig I, I played was, I think I was 14. But then the first tour that I was on was when I was, um, yeah, was uh, 17. Yeah. yeah. And, cool. no, it was, um, no, it was absolutely just an amazing experience. And I think all, all four of us, Ryan, Pat, Gabe, and I, um, we all just uh, and and our uh, our friend Tom, who traveled with us, uh, we all reminisce a lot about that first tour because it was kind of like, you know, we didn't know what to expect, and all these uh, crazy moments happened on that tour that made all of us want to go. Hey, we want to be full time musicians. Your dad, Larry Gowan, is a famous Canadian who's uh, playing in a internationally famous band, Sticks, and uh, and Larry actually. Um, impressed me when he was, his, I don't know if it was his first album, but the, the one that everybody um, knows, uh, with Tony Levin on the bass. Oh, yeah. Or Chapman Stick. And, you know, your dad's obviously musical, international, elite. And, uh, 
And so that's what I'm saying. It was that's not not to say that these people walking in and out were intimidating. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody's really nice. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's kind of rub off on you. Yeah, no, it's it's got it, it definitely has. I mean, but you just see the the way that they all conduct themselves and like they're not only just amazing players, but they're amazing people as well. How they're they have this level of professionalism that goes a long way, and as well as their talent kind of takes them the extra step. And and it's weird though. It's like when 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 just meeting um, friends of dads or people who have collaborated with dad on on a couple of songs, and you get to meet um, uh, all these different musicians. You know, you never you never really get intimidated because they're just they're just a you know they're just a human being so <laughs> so it's just a um so it's just cool that you get to meet you get to meet all of them and you kind of get to know that their um like their musical journey and their life story and how that influences your uh your own and no it's you know even meeting even meeting somebody like like Tony Levin who is who is just a an absolute world class uh, bass player, and we we actually got to see him last year when he was playing with um, King Crimson, and just seeing how well he was able to play, and just and then he just comes out after after the show, and he's just very very nice. And I remember on the drive on the drive back uh, from from that show, and Dad and I were kind of talking about, about Tony Levin, and how. He he was just a guy who never took a gig for granted. Like you remember, he, I, like Tony was also one of those musicians who he could play a place like um, like the ACC and play it to twenty thousand people, and then later on that same week he could be playing to um, to like a very small bar and play in front of like. 10 20 people and just have as much joy as he was as he was playing 20,000 people or playing to 20,000 people so it's i had the opportunity to meet tony um when the stick men came to town i interviewed marcus and so uh that was quite an inside track it was very very fortunate opportunity yeah yeah <laughs> and it was a very fortunate opportunity when i came to the vesperia show at the garrison a couple of years ago yeah and who walks in but your dad and uh when i approached him and asked for an interview actually i asked who should i call <laughs> to ask for an interview <laughs> and your dad was nice enough to say let's do it kamikaze style yeah, yeah. so it was brilliant it was uh it was nice and short you know i I didn't want to take up too much of his time. He had a date that night. I think, <laughs> I think it was your mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was the, the um, like it's 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 always it's always great to see him to see him at shows. Um, it's like when when you're a little kid and you draw something and you go up to your parents and you just go, "Hey, look what I drew!" Right? <laughs> but this is the the adult version of that is like, "Hey, this is my band." <laughs> great story. You know, um, so it's always was, it's always really nice to see them at shows. Always really great. And you've you've actually collaborated maybe more than just the one recently for COVID. There was a song you put out just a little while back on the on the internet. Yeah. That. Awesome. Well, that that one was. Um, well, since since we've been kind of uh, isolated, we. Um, Dad was kind of revisiting some of his older um, catalog, and and he had this idea of me playing drums when he was redoing "Out of a Deeper Hunger." And when um, and when that whole thing was starting to um, was starting to get into the the recording phase of it, then I hopped on drums, and then we we put out a video a couple weeks ago, and it was um, no, and the reception went really well. I I was really happy with how it went. And it, I think that was the first song I think he and I have ever um, collaborated on, I think. Really? I think. I, I, we've played the shows together a couple of times. Um, like, we've played, um, like, uh, CBC uh, Theater. I'm trying to remember what that CBC Theater is called. It's kind of... Uh, it's, the Gould? I think it's the Glen Gould Theater. Yeah, I think we we did that with it was for John McDermott's um, Christmas special. I think. Um, 
Uh-huh. Yeah, so we, were, we so we we've done that, and, we, and I did a, a fill-in show in, uh, with him in Moncton uh, when we were uh, playing a, alongside Burton Cummings and Nazareth and Sass Jordan. So we were, uh, so we did that. I think there's more of a story in this one now. Yeah, <laughs> this is the big one. Yeah, well that one, um, well that story was Todd couldn't make Todd couldn't make that gig. Um, Todd Zuckerman, who plays who plays. Yeah, he also plays in um, in Sticks, and he's my all time favorite favorite drummer. And when he um, when he couldn't do the show, uh, I I filled in, so I had to really study his playing and try and get to at least a tenth of how good he is in terms of just just like in terms of groove and uh, just fills and all that all that uh, you know stuff like that. I had to you know put in a lot of time just kind of knowing uh just how he plays and how he approaches songs and and playing and playing in that kind of environment where it's like okay you're playing um it's like it's a different environment when you when you're playing normally with a metal band and and the audience is like right right in front of you and you can see you can see the back of the venue where where your merch table is it's different when you see <laughs> When you see the crowd is a little bit farther from you, and it's like rows and rows and rows of people, and you go like, "Who's watching merch?" That kind of thing, right? So, <laughs> like, um, so it's a bit, you know, you get uh, intimidated a little bit, but but I think it's more you're more anxious to play than 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 nervousness. Yeah, yeah. And the music kicks in, and oh, then you're off to the races. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so that's a pretty good story now. Um, that's not something of a challenging story, but what about a funny anecdote? You got anything from the road? Oh, like a funny story? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, plenty. <laughs> well, I remember um, one of the f- one of the funniest stories. Well, I wouldn't say it would be it'd be funny for um, for Casey, but. Before before we went to to Vakken, we did a short run of the west coast of Canada to try out some new songs and to try out our set list that we were going to play at Vakken Open Air. And this is with Vesperia. This is with Vesperia, yeah. And, and incidentally, you won that. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, so we we played a festival um, out in um, in Armstrong, BC, that has like they have like an annual like. Um, yeah, like an annual metal festival out there, and we got invited to play uh, to play one of the main stages out there. So, so as we're as we're uh, you know waiting for our time to to go on, we were talking a lot with some of the other bands that was playing there, and kind of uh, like talking about uh, well, oddly enough, we were talking about like touring stories and trading back and forth. And Casey on on tour during that time, he would always bring a unicycle out and. Um, and lo and behold, um, he fell off his unicycle, and he, uh, and he, uh, well, let's just say the nail on his big toe was hanging on for dear life. <laughs> and and we were just we were kind of freaking out, going like, "Holy crap! Is Casey going to play the set?" So what we did was we rushed him to um, these paramedics that were that were on site, and basically. They just gave him a bunch of like polysporin and, and like alcohol disinfectant, and we we're just pouring it on this on, on Casey's toe and just trying to make sure that he was okay. But he lost his shoe as well during that whole that whole time. So we took a bunch of bandages that they gave us. We wrapped Casey's toe and we grabbed this Pilsner uh, box and we just put that under his uh, under his shoe. Sorry, not under his feet. Sorry, and just basically shoved him on stage. And so, if you look at the photos, there's a gigantic Pilsner box kind of hanging over Casey's foot the entire time. He played the set really well. You know, you gotta admit it makes you giddy when you meet somebody famous. Well, it, it's it's. Um, I mean, when when you when you <laughs> when you meet somebody who is. Um, you know, when you meet somebody who is like, let's say, your your idol or something like that, then yeah. then you might get a little like butterflies in your stomach, right? But um, but still, it's like they're still just a just a human being, right? 
why is music the great communicator? I think um, music is just is just the universal language. It can really heal people. It can really um, you can relate to to um, to a, a musician or a type of song, even if they don't share the same language or um, uh, even though they, they could be speaking in Swedish or um, or French or whatever language you can think of. It's like if the song, if you really like the song and it resonates with you, then you have a, a personal attachment to it. And that's why it can be such a great, um, you know, it's a great healer and it connects a lot of people together. And, and, um, and you know, when you start forming in different bands, you have guys like, you'll have bands where you have people from all different backgrounds and cultures and, you know, maybe English is their second language and you have, um, and you want to throw like their first language into a couple of songs because it's really cool and um, uh, to have a to have a section that's just dedicated towards uh, towards that or um, you know there's a ton of different things that that, that makes music such a con like that that there's like kind of this um, it brings it brings people together and um, and I think you know with with the times that we're we're in right now where there's a lot of there's a lot of unrest and there's a lot of um there's a lot of anger there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh you're, you're also there's a lot of uh uncertainty with how the future um is is going to turn out and i think that um just for a brief moment just by listening to to music it can kind of uh have a, a bit of a healing effect with what's going on in the world because it's right now we're we're in very scary times right now and something that you do experience which is multi-genreism yeah you know, this is similar to multiculturalism and and uh and an open mind in general um when when i first saw your dad play it was at seneca college i was in the radio i was at the radio station and I unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to interview him that day, but um, I did see the show that night. And, and he goes off into this section, you know, after playing a couple of the great songs that he that he uh, wrote. Yeah. Uh, he goes into a section about the different genres, and and part of it was Dixieland, and then he'd go into a section of that, and of course he'd go back into some classical riffs and and. It's not just education that opens your mind, but it is part of it to to actually, you know, uh, learn about a time that's that's different from yours. Yeah, I you know, it's learn about a people that are different than you. Mm -hmm. And and I think when you when you look at um, when you look at all different genres, you see the history of it, and you see the kind of um, like what it took to get that style of music popularized and what it took for for these artists um, to evolve specific genres and or pretty much sorry not specific genres just all genres in general how it took us it took a handful of people to get it to get the ball rolling and then it took another generation and then the generation after that to start evolving the sound more and then combining some some of their own um, their own stuff to it right and when you're playing when you're when you want to play music for a living you have to have an appreciation for all genres now i play i play pri primarily um, rock music and that's that's heavily rooted in you know in blues it's heavily rooted in in jazz and it can and there's some bits of classical in there there's a lot of different influences that make up rock music sure. and and then with um with you when you have like okay for example like birds of bellwoods who are you know they're they're alternative and they also have this indie rock sound and they have um they have electronic elements and they have a, a heavy folk influence into it and they have a, that kind of combination and i think when you're playing when you're playing music in general, you want to have that kind of appreciation for all styles because one, it just makes you a better player, and two, it, you're not um, you're not pigeonholing yourself to um, 
into one style. You you're able to branch out and to play uh, play multiple different um, genres. It helps. It helps your playing. Oh, absolutely. It's like why why limit yourself to just one genre when you can like play a time. Like I remember when I was when I was at university, I would be like my my iPod would change constantly. It would go from Little Richard to uh, Opeth to then um, to then Tower of Power to um, like Catatonia or Code and Cambria or Meshuggah or uh, you know it, it, it bounces it bounces all over the place and yeah it's and and plus with Iomer we wanted to throw in everything in the kitchen sink at it so that's why there's one song where it sounds like um, like there's one song that we had um, called Dance of Eternal Insan of of Eternal Insanity. And there's uh there's sections in it where it starts off as kind of this like Latin jazz moment and then it goes into a folk rock thing, then it goes to metal, and then it jumps into this um this uh prog section and then it ties that all together. And it's uh no, you, you just want to play as as much as possible and, and kind of be be forever a student. And so you mentioned a little bit about uh, the birds style, the birds of Bellwood style being uh, indie and folky, and and that's quite divergent from your your uh, upbeat uh, double kick. Yeah. <laughs> um, what um, what sort of drum influence do you call on? You know for that role well uh good question i mean like one of my all-time favorite drummers is um uh, steve jordan that guy is just an absolute amazing player and he's got he's got just that he just has the formula down perfect for for pocket and and um just listening to his playing and it's just like how you know there's just a, a distinct rhythm to it that is needed for a band like Birds of Bellwoods who has this heavy emphasis on groove and but also has this moment of, of intensity too and I don't think they even realize it themselves how they have a lot of really kind of upbeat and heavy rock influence stuff so there's moments where you have to you know go to um, you know Taylor Hawkins you know like from the drummer for the Foo Fighters and play play that kind of uh, in that kind of style, yeah. So you kind of have to have this kind of balance between those two players with with birds, and they're a band that's heavily uh, heavily influenced by pretty much everything in it and uh, in anything. I think except for like extreme metal, <laughs> but I, I think Which is, you, you get your yeah yes out of the other band. Yeah, 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 and it's it's funny. When I was when I was auditioning uh, for Birds of Bellwoods, I remember um, Adrian. Uh, uh, he comes up to me during the audition. I come out with like a Motorhead shirt, and and um, I think I was wearing a toque at that time. Uh, and and Adrian just kind of jokingly goes, "Are you sure you're at the right audition?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm at the right audition." So it's like. <laughs> So it kind of it's it's funny just kind of going from that moment where it's like where where they go like are you interested in playing drums for us and I'm like absolutely I can play anything and I like it yeah well I mean it's like you know it was but going through that um, going through um, you know the next phase in in uh, you know my career being a part of Birds of Bellwoods from uh, from a live standpoint as well as like you know, jamming with them in the rehearsal space, it's been, it's been great. I mean, the last, uh, last year we, uh, we did Rock the Rink tour, which was completely amazing. Like, okay, so Rock the Rink was, was something different, uh, for, for Birds of Bellwoods. And I don't think it's ever been, ever been done before on a touring standpoint. So what it was, was a rock band opening up for a figure skating show. Sounds great. So it's a weird kind of like kind of Canadian Championship skating type stuff. Yeah, well, it was it was headlined by uh, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer, who are like the oh, yeah. like the Wayne Gretzky 
uh, and Sidney Crosby it was of ABC production, I suppose. Yeah, and it was it was just great kind of knowing all the figure skaters like Elvis Stoiko was was one of them, um, Caitlin Osmond, uh, Jeremy Abbott, um, Patrick Chan. It was really it was really cool getting to know uh, you know some of uh, like basically the, the best ath the best athletes in that sport. And hey, I have a I have a high school friend who was fifth in Calgary a long time ago. Oh, amazing! <laughs> in figure skating. Yeah, and oh, I can even tell you one of the funny moments from that tour. So, okay. so we um, so over time in the tour, we started um, you know we started hanging out more with um, with members of of the crew and uh, and uh, you know be, <laughs> these Olympians, right? So. It, so it was kind of it was it was nice in the sense where like they were talking to somebody that was on a completely different end of like the of the entertainment industry so it's like so it was it was it was kind of this fa this like this fascination of telling tour stories from a musician standpoint and them telling stories of them being in the olympics so it was kind of a cool back and forth and yeah. and over time over time it would be kind of uh, like we would start to do some of this, like they they started inviting us to to train with them, and like you know they're like sprinting like five five miles ahead, and all of us are like <laughs> gasping for breath, right? Um, but you know on top of that, you know we get to like you know skate with them every now and again, and like you know they're all they're all just great. But sorry, that's to... that's funny. One of my musician friends compares it to. Uh, um longevity at night like, the olympians can do their their jog in the middle of the day but I, i'd like to see them stay up till three in the morning and do double kick yeah <laughs> <laughs> well there was so to kind of go uh, to go to the like one of this one of the funniest moments on on the tour was when we had a few days off in sudbury and it was around um halloween so we uh we started uh a kind of a, a joke band called Laska Laska Highway and that was with um and it was with uh it was Birds of Bellwoods and myself and uh Jeremy Abbott who um and so we all formed this kind of fake band and we made we spent the whole afternoon making this minute long song which was kind of like like a Beastie Boys kind of um kind of thing and it's it's so it's on it's on um, it's on Instagram and you know and people from the tour, um, people from like people who came out to the shows on that tour like found out who this band was and uh, like and they're, they're now like sending messages going like when's the next when's the Alaska yes. Highway yeah, CD coming out the new spinal tap. yeah and and it got to the point where on the last week and a half of shows. Um, they started putting that in the PA before we walk on and do our set. Oh, so the opening, so just before the opening song for our set would be that joke song that we did. <laughs> Created a monster. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it was a ton of fun that whole run. And I'm, and I'm glad, and I'm glad it wasn't one of the tours where, because sometimes when you're, when you go on tour, it's like, you it's almost like being at it's like being at summer camp in a way and sometimes after the tour is over you don't really talk to the people that you um that you went on tour with after it was poor, more or less like uh like hey nice to meet you how you doing you know great great working with you and then they leave and then you don't really hear anything from them sure. but this tour was different in the sense that like everyone kept in touch which oh, cool. which is which was awesome so i, I it was you know, it was it was definitely an an amazing experience, and getting to share that with with my friends and Birds of Bellwoods, and making new friends with all these amazing athletes and the crew that was a part of that tour. It was yeah, it was absolutely amazing. Well, you give me uh, an idea for two follow ups. One is uh, one is that I want I want you to compare your styles between Iomar and um, Vesperia. So yeah, well, Vesperia is more or less like a symphonic death metal band, which is pretty much you have this really fast death metal style riffing and um and uh and just songwriting but you have elements of an orchestra backing up that band 
And so it kind of creates this epic atmosphere with Vesperia. And then that's what the band has, be has become is kind of like, yeah, a combination of like, you could say like the Toronto Symphony Orchestra doing an approach of death metal. And, and Iomer is pretty much a combination of folk music and progressive music. So it's a combination of folk, um, folk songs that are either deeply rooted within, um, like either Americana or, um, Celtic music or, um, or just like folk music in general, it can be, it's a very kind of global, um, global term in the sense that folk music really just originates from countries that come up with their own, uh, songs that is reminiscent about um just about basically the land that they live on and or the or the stories that they tell so it's it's kind of a an umbrella term in this in the sense that it's there's so many different definitions of folk music in general um so and then when we combine that with progressive metal which is basically everything in the kitchen sink thrown at it and there's a heavy emphasis on groove and uh, and song and in terms of the song structure, it's like you can just combine anything. Like uh, like Sam never told me that he was a uh, that um, he used to rap. Um, I think I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't know exactly what 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 the what the language is in um, uh, Bangladesh. I think it's. I'm not entirely sure what the official language is, but but Sam speaks um, speaks in two languages, and he raps okay. in that. In, in, yeah, anybody. Oh, he raps in a Bangladesh language. Yeah, he raps in a Bangladesh language, that's and so he, interesting. and when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's so cool. Why why don't you, why don't you try that in um, in an Iomer track? And he's like, sure. So it was cool to kind of get. Um, but also with when it comes to Iomer, I really want everybody to like, you know, be as creative as possible in terms of like, hey, if you want to throw in a funk section with this Latin part, with this, you know, death metal part, you can do that. Yeah. And and I think that's, you know, it's Iomer is very much in the in the vein of like you can, it's like do whatever you want, do. Um, you, so how many you're on the third record for Iron Man? So right now I'm I'm wrapping up the the second the second record for Iron Man and then there is and I've hinted at a third one um, that's looking like it's gonna happen with within within the year. So that's a lot of material and not a lot of time. Well, that's the uh, well that's the only ones that have been have been announced yet. There's a. Um, instrumental record that I'm currently finishing uh, the writing process with. We're probably not going to record it until uh, the end of the year, but um, but we're working on that, and that's myself and uh, Ryan Bovaird. We're, we're, we've been working on that as well, kind of uh, when we when we have the, the moment, so. Wow, okay, and is there any other uh, future <laughs> okay, you... and is there any other future plans that you'd like to discuss or that you can discuss or uh... well we well we just um well birds bell was just released um their their first um uh single this year which was um which was pine box and i was lucky enough to be to be playing drums on that uh on that track so it was um it was cool in the sense where it was where it's like you know you've been in you've been in the band um like uh, as you've been in the band as a live member for for a while and you're kind of uncertain of whether or not you're going to be playing on a on a track and and then and then during that time during this quarantine they were like hey you want to play drums on a track and i'm like absolutely oh, so um so i got Something to good has come out of this. oh dude there's been many great things that have come out of it <laughs> but it was it was cool to kind of to kind of uh you know uh, to play it on on one of their tracks and yeah. and then you know going back like just the couple of days ago we've we finally gone back to the rehearsal space since um, since entering uh, phase two so we've yes. so I was jamming along with them and helping out with uh, a couple of demo tracks and you know there's a lot of really cool stuff that that these guys are are coming up with and uh, yeah I was excited to to play drums on it so. Uh, fingers crossed if I'm playing on the record. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I am. We'll see. 
Um, all right, so well, let's uh, conclude by uh, asking you how best people should touch base with you. Do you have a dot com of your own, or do you want to suggest one of the best ways? Well, the best way, um, uh, I guess, to, um, to to contact me would either be through uh, my Instagram page, which is uh, Dylan.Gowan. And uh, that's the best way to, to reach me as well as um, checking out any one of the uh, the bands that I'm in. I have a, I have a link of all the of all the bands that I'm in. So um, if you're interested in checking any one of those projects out, then I have the the links in my Instagram page all for them. And uh, also just on Facebook, I think I'm just like you can look it look yeah, me up on, on Facebook. yeah yeah exactly. So it's like you can look up um, me on Facebook where there's a photo of me and my dog. Kind of doing uh doing a, like a metal band pose so it's, it's like um yeah i mean that's that's the best way to 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 keep in touch that's cool well really appreciate talking to you again uh, same to you man that's it for musicians and bars getting beer with dylan gallon <laughs> cheers thanks for having me